Okay. Uh, so I'm Himadri. I'm a final year PhD student in the Whisper Group at INRIA Paris. Um, and my thesis is supervised by Jean-Pierre Lauzy and Julia Laval. Um, I would like to start this talk with a note for the organizers. So I've been coming to Kano Recipes since past three con consecutive years. And every year, I see more and more women in the room. It makes me very happy. So thank you for making it, that happen. And while we are on the subject, I would also like to give a shout out to the Outreach Internship Program. Um, and there are many people today present in the room are also involved with the program, so keep doing that good work. We really need it. <laughs> also, a shout out to the LFX Mentorship Program um, and all my mentors who have been mentoring throughout these years. Um, oh yeah, I was supposed to say something after this. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, uh, thank you, Linux Foundation. Uh, for providing me with scholarships from time to time to go to kernel conferences uh, so that I can pick brains of developers and maintainers. And last but not the least, thank you to all the developers and maintainers who have uh, took interest in my research and provided me with feedback. It has really helped uh, progress this work. Um, so thank you. Okay, let's get started. So this is the outline uh, of today's presentation. Uh, I'm going to start by giving uh, the context of dual level of task scheduling, um, and then we will look at what are the pain points. Uh, we would then go into looking at the existing solutions. I call them partial solutions because none of these um, solve all the issues that are there in the uh, virtualized context uh, task scheduling domain. Um, and then there are two very interesting proposals, which are quite recent. One is from Academia, one is from uh, the LKML mail list, so we will have a look at that. Um, and then finally, um, I would talk about the research that we have been doing at INRIA, which uh, sort of builds on top of uh, the para-virtualized uh, scheduling frameworks. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, that's the outline. So as I said, the context is dual level of task scheduling. So whenever an application is running inside a virtual machine, suppose you have a thread that belongs to that application, so the first level of task placement decisions that are going to happen are on the guest scheduler level, and those decisions are mainly going to be which task thread is going to be put on which of the vCPUs. The next level of task scheduling will happen on the host scheduler level where the decision is about which vCPU task is going to be placed on which of the PCPU, uh, which one of the PCPUs. And the issue is both levels of schedulers, the host and the guest, only possess partial information. Um, and none of them have the complete picture in order to make correct task placement decisions across both the levels. So the guest knows what the application thread is doing but it doesn't know what the vCPU status is on the host. On the other hand, the host knows about the vCPU status, but it has no idea what the thread is doing inside the virtual machine. This creates a semantic gap, and there's come the pain points. They are all rooted in the semantic gap, and primarily because of ill-timed vCPU preemptions. So, as we all know, vCPUs are no special citizens. They run as... Um, get normal uh, regular task. That means the host scheduler can preempt a vCPU at any time. And when does the preemption happen that matters? What was the application thread doing on that vCPU inside the guest? That also matters. If it was doing something critical and the vCPU gets preempted, that is bad. It is going to hurt the application performance. So. The problem also becomes even worse when we are in an oversubscribed environment, which is a fairly common practice in cloud uh, environments, because it is simply going to increase the likelihood for a vCPU to get preempted at a bad time. And of course, there are various consequences. So there is this very nice paper that uh, nicely describes uh, most of these consequences along with the existing academic uh, solutions. So if you are interested, it would be an interesting read. Um, 
And then there is this other set of pain that comes from pure ambition, I would say, because we are running things inside the VM, but we still want bare metal-like performance. And bare metal performance has been like getting improved over years because the scheduler evolves with the hardware technologies. So there are lots of scheduler optimizations that we get to use when you run the workload on, on bare metal. But many of them are not available to the guest scheduler, and hence we can't fully exploit um, this optimization when we are running a guest parallel application. And so there is a lot of interest um, in academia as well as in industry. If you, if you look at all the recent papers in let's say, the last two, three years of conferences, or if you look at all the scheduler-related talks at LPC or OSVM, you would hear things about, oh, how do we expose the new my information correctly? How do we um, tell which physical cores are siblings of each other properly in a timely manner to the guest scheduler? Um, how do we expose the frequency for DVFS systems to the vCPUs and, and, and to the guest scheduler? Or recently, I think just last week at LPC, there was a very nice talk about exposing the CPU capacity to the guest scheduler. So all this um, is missed opportunity because since we cannot expose this information, we are losing on performance and we are far from bare metal-like performance. So of course there are um, solutions in place. Um, many of them are already in upstream. But again, as I said, I would call them partial because there are still one or more issues that remain even after having all these solutions. For example, the very first and obvious thing is to not use oversubscription. Um, have dedicated resource partitioning and pin all your vCPUs to vCPUs. You get rid of one level of scheduler essentially, and a lot of the pain points that I described simply just go away. But at the same time, it's going to be expensive for us, you as a customer. Uh, not very appealing for the cloud providers because it goes against the whole resource consolidation um, goal that, that providers have. Um, and most importantly, all this, uh, like the ambitious part of having as good performance as bare metal, that portion is still missing because we are not really, go by pinning and resource partitioning, we are still missing on the hardware information in the guest scheduler. Um, the next uh, solution we have that is already um, in the kernel uh, in KVM um, is the steel time computation. So I would again say that it is a corrective solution rather than preventive. So VCB preemptions are still going to happen, but we are adjusting the vrun time in the guest so that the task doesn't get penalized um, in, an, in an unfair way. But you could still get preempted at a bad time. And uh, the last solution that I would like to mention is the forced VM exit once you exceed the PLE limit. Um, so you could implement your spin loops using pause instructions, um, and then hardware can detect if a vCPU has been spinning excessively. And this is done uh, by two parameters. So first of all, we are monitoring um, how far apart are the pause instructions. Um, and there is this tunable parameter PLE gap um, that is going to tell us if like, the interval is tolerable or not. Um, and then if we are exceeding, uh, sorry, if, if the pose instructions are too close apart, then we are going to look at how long this situation has been going on, if it is within the tolerable uh, limit or not, and we determine that by the PLE window, which is, again, uh, it keeps changing and it's also tunable. And finally, if we are at a stage where this thing has been going on and like the limit has been exited, then the hypervisor is going to take over. There is going to be a forced VM exit for this spinning vCPU. And then there is an attempt about mitigating the situation by selecting a candidate vCPU that might release the resource that the first vCPU was spinning for. But again, this is all best effort. So um, you might need to try multiple vCPUs to resolve the situation. OK. Um, so the next two solutions that I want to um, talk about 
are more in the direction of uh, para virtualization, cooperative sc scheduling, because they are promising, and also they also um, they they seem to propose a generic framework which could be used in various scenarios. So depending on if you have a workload that is concerned by lock, then you can implement a policy that is specific to lock holder preemption. Um, and, and similarly, if you have a workload that is doing a lot of IO and you care about IO uh, reactivity time. So, so there is a lot of flexibility that you can implement on top of um, these two solutions. So first one is this paper from AS Plus. It's from last year. Um, and this is a very uh, good design in the way that the core idea is that there is information present at both the levels. We just need to communicate it. Um, so the host scheduler passes the scheduler, schedule, uh, scheduling related information that it has to a backend, um, and that writes into a reference table. And then the guest scheduler consumes information uh, using a front end from the same reference table. And in this particular paper, they t implement one policy that is about uh, that that depends on the load of the PCPs, and at the same time, there is other policy uh, that is about exposing the topology information. So again, a very interesting paper, uh, a good proposal about having something generic that has flexibility and people can do whatever they want with um, a framework like this. The next is, um, I, I think many of you have already paid attention to this pet set. So it was posted maybe earlier this year, like the very first version. Everything was pretty much in KVM, um, like the boosting logic um, and, and how the shared memory worked. It was all very KVM specific, and which was uh, not well received in KVM community. And as well as, um, I mean, if you have followed through the thread, you would know like there are um, rightful ar arguments against this design. Then there was version two. The policy part, they moved it out from KVM, um, but still the handshaking um, and shared memory setup, it went through KVM. And version three is not posted yet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but last week at LPC, they gave a talk uh, and they showed what is the design. And now pretty much nothing is inside KVM. So again, this is a good design once if once and if it gets um, accepted, it would give people a chance to directly build their policies on top of it. OK. So suppose we have got that part sorted. Our shared memory is properly set up. Our guest and the host scheduler can communicate, and we can communicate which information we want, depending on whatever is our use case. But you could take a step ahead. Um, and make the user space aware that, OK, you are running inside a virtual machine, um, and you don't really have as many CPUs as you think you have. You actually have less number of vCPUs, or maybe um, and, and, and do, do whatever you want to do with this information. And then at INRIA, in our group, we have been exploring what we can do with this information. And our research primarily focuses on the use case of guest parallel applications that run on oversubscribed hosts. So lots of vCPU preemptions happen. Um, and the applications generally achieve parallelization using various parallel application runtimes. You might be familiar with OpenMP, OpenMPI. And, and these libraries use um, various standard, like, like for example, OpenMP's uh, implementation would rely on glibc for uh, getting system-related information. And essentially, what you are going to get is how many cores are there on the machine. And the, your library doesn't know you are inside a virtual machine. Your vCPUs could be preempted. Um, so you will end up using more worker threads than the actual number of vCPUs you are able to run. And which is incorrect. It also hurts performance. So that's the issue. The libraries are oblivious to the phenomena that vCPU preemptions happen, um, and that hurts the application performance. So we want to fix that. How do we want to fix that? So we came up with a solution where 
we aggregate the information about vCPU preemptions on the host in a timely and accurate manner. And then we use this information in the libraries to adjust the number of parallel workers um, at runtime dynamically um, and depending on the load changing or like the oversubscription situation changing on the host, um, the workload can expand or shrink, but it can keep using the correct number of uh, worker threads, as many number as, uh, of threads, as many number of vCPUs that are actually able to run on the host. So here is a pictorial representation. Um, suppose you have an application that is running inside a VM that is use, configured using four vCPUs. So OpenMP is going to decide that, okay, I will fork off four worker threads, um, and guest scheduler would put each worker thread on each of the vCPUs. But actually, you are in an oversubscribed scenario, and you are only able to run two of your vCPUs. So vCPU2 and vCPU3 are happy because they got to run on vCPU1 and vCPU2. But the threads which are stuck on vCPU1 and vCPU4 are not really happy. Um, and this is going to impact the performance because all of these thread need to all of these threads need to reach a barrier. Um, and b before all of them reach their next parallel section cannot start, so your application progress is also hindered because of this. And what our policy does is that it detects that, hey, only two of the vCPUs are able to run during this period of time. So I would shrink the number of worker threads, but I would shrink to a correct value, and I know that those would get to run. So it is going to ensure that the forward application progress is, um, is uh, progress is made. Okay, so then, of course, why would it work? And, and to understand that, let, let's, let's take an example. So um, the well-known NAS parallel benchmark search has uh, OpenMP implementation. I've selected an application, it's called UA. I'm running it with a reasonable amount of input size, class B. I selected this because it has unstructured computation, um, and you have three major loops, essentially, and which are parallelized using 40,000 internal barriers, so it's very fine grain in the way OpenMP achieves parallelization for this benchmark. Um, and then uh, for OpenMP, we are using libgump with GCC 12 release branch. I have a host that has 36 vCPUs. It's a single socket machine, so we can ignore the NUMA effects. Um, it is running 6.11 RC4 kernel with Debian testing. I have a guest that I've configured with a stable kernel, a bit behind on like the latest release, 6.6.16. Um, but again, we have 36 vCPUs. So in an ideal world, where there is no oversubscription, no overload, everything is fine. 36 vCPUs running on 36 vCPUs, sorry, 36 vCPUs running on 36 vCPUs, um, and all of the vCPUs should be able to run. Now, when OpenMP worker threads um, are running, they have two options to when it comes to synchronizing over the barriers. Option one is you keep spinning. Option two is you block. And you can change this behavior by using the OMP weight policy environment variable. So in an ideal world where we have 36 vCPUs, 36 vCPUs, no vCPU preemptions, it, it is much more faster to spin at the barriers, how 80% faster. So that's great. But in the real world, where you are going to have vCPU preemptions, there your application performance is going to drop way more if you were using spinning versus you were using blocking. And this degradation in spinning performance is going to increase with the increase in number of your preempted vCPUs. So, if your degree of oversubscription increases, if there is some noisy neighbor, you are in a bad situation if you are using spinning. What we would like to do is that spinning is fast, so we want to use spinning. But at the same time, it, it degrades the performance if you have preempted vCPUs. So spin, but with 
minimized number of preempted vCPUs. So here, there is a graph. It's for the same application, same uh, experiment setup that I described before in the example. Uh, the x-axis shows time. On y-axis, you see core numbers, so it goes up to 0 to 36. And the green line shows how many worker threads we are using inside the guest for running this benchmark. And to simulate a overload scenario from time to time, I'm launching a noisy neighbor uh, at every one second. So at every one second, I'm launching 18, 18 spinners as a parallel workload on the host that is going to go and preempt our vCPUs, just bother them for no reason. Um, but since we are using fair scheduler at both levels, it comes down to our VM gets allocated 18 pCPUs, um, and the noisy neighbor takes up the remaining 18 pCPUs. So the right thing to do with, with no preempted vCPUs when we are spinning would be when the noisy neighbor shows up, we should reduce our degree of parallelization to 18 in order to ensure the forward progress of our application. And at the same time, we want to quickly detect when the noise is gone or when we have the opportunity to use as many PCPUs we can, we would want to expand. Again, this uh, works, I mean, how well this would work depends on two things. One is like at what granularity we are computing this number of preempted VCPUs on the host and at what granularity the benchmark is parallelized in the guest. So for this benchmark, it's very, very fine-grained. So as soon as we compute the right value on the host, it is very soon going to get used in the, in the, uh, in the guest. So as you can see, we, with this policy, we are able to adapt the degree of parallelization dynamically um, and very quickly. Now we can do this because, I, I mean, Technically, you could do this with um, other libraries as well. With OpenMP, it is a bit easier to do it because it already offers you this OMP dynamic interface, which can change number of running threads at runtime. Um, and they use the load average metric, but then it is too coarse grain. And if you simply look at the load average, it's also going to include the load that you contribute, like your own vCPUs contribute. And we just want to um, do the correction based on how much preemptions we are getting by someone else. Um, so we compute our own metric, um, but, but we implement it with help of this interface. So how, how well does it work? So as I showed these numbers before, we have the spinning case, we have the blocking case, and now we have the case where we minimize the number of preempted CPUs and, and we um, adapt the degree of parallelization and it improves performance. Okay, so what do we change? In, in the library itself, it's a very small change. We, we add only one new system call that is going to read this value of uh, para-virtualized scheduling information that we have computed on the host. Um, we are going to do like some sanity check that it's a valid value, it was computed within the uh, latest duration on the host, etc. So that is like the is valid part. And then when we are on the next uh, uh, next barrier and we need to determine how many worker threads we use for this next section of parallel computation, we are going to do this adjustment. We would know how many workers we were using before. We would know how many um, preempted vCPUs we saw within the previous window and, and we would um, adapt the degree of uh, parallelization like that. What we change in the host kernel is also um, like no rocket science. We simply monitor the scheduling decisions made that include vCPUs. And specifically, we're interested in understanding what happens when a vCPU wants to wake up. When a vCPU wants to wake up, it would have like one of the two things would happen, right? There would be an idle vCPU and it would get to run immediately or the resources are busy, so it would have to go and wait in the run queue. Um, so if it has to go and wait in the run queue, then we want to know for how long it had to wait, do that wait. Um, and and we, we would measure this by, with help of a sample. So, so every time a vCPU wants to wake up, we will record a sample. Sample is essentially telling how many vCPUs are able to run, 
what was the current time when this VCP used to uh, try to wake up, and then what it, and then there is like a new sample that gets recorded inside the schedule function just before the context switch, where we would get to know, okay, when it actually got to run. Um, at the same time, we also want to keep track of um, how busy is our host, and computing load average, um, or like looking at the load average is one way. Um, but, the, but the way we, we, we decide this is by keeping track of the idle course. Because since we are already monitoring things inside the schedule function, we can make a note if a pCPU became idle or not. But again, we want to know for how long the pCPU was idle. So there is a sample that gets recorded when a pCPU becomes idle. Another sample we record when an idle, CPU uh, idle pCPU becomes busy again. Um, and again, coming back to monitoring the scheduling decisions about our vCPUs, we are looking at the context switches that involve vCPUs. So suppose a vCPU that was running is now getting preempted, so the previous task is going to be the vCPU, um, and it is now becoming a preempted vCPU. So there are like some additional tests that I'm um, hiding behind this preempted vCPU function, um, but, but essentially we check like what was the what was the state of this task? Um, there are like some other flags that we set as part of the policy. So that all checking happens there, but I just wanted to make it all fit nicely on one slide. So that's why I'm omitting all those details. But essentially, if a running vCPU gets preempted, we are going to record a sample. At the same time, if a vCPU that gets to run, we are also going to record a sample. And every time we record a sample, it essentially means that the number of vCPUs that are actually able to run are either incrementing by one or decrementing by one. And we have a per VM global variable um, that we update uh, when we record the samples. And finally, we compute the PV sched info. And currently, we do it at every scheduler tick. So the granularity of how often this is calculated on the host is four milliseconds. Um, and in the case of the UA benchmark, how often it gets looked up is multiple times within a tick. So it, it, it kind of works out in the way that you, you know that some major scheduling decisions could happen from like the, uh, at the duration of a scheduler tick, and you are not doing something um, at a, a random interval. You are like trying to sync your computation with the scheduler's own uh, bookkeeping. So this is the prototype. Now the interesting part about this prototype is that there would be multiple ways to realize this shared memory because again this is monitoring that happens on the host. The information needs to be communicated to the guest so that the system call can access that value for OpenMP. And currently we are using this special kind of IV SHMEM device. It is primarily intended to share user space memory between the guest and the host, um, but we are changing the file operations so that we are able to uh, share the kernel memory. And that also brings me to the conclusion, is that when I was making that prototype, it was not super clear what is the right way to expose kernel memory for scheduling purposes. Para-virtualized solutions are, are promising. Uh, cooperative scheduling idea, you could use it depending on your use case, but it could go on solving probably all of the semantic gap problems. But at the same time, each of the solution is going to require um, this shared memory. And I mean, I can point out, I don't know, maybe a dozen different projects, works, like papers from uh, academic conferences or something people presented um, at kernel conferences. Pretty much everyone ends up with a custom implementation for this shared memory. Um, so I, I would want to conclude with that it is about time we, we, we standardize this interface so that people can actually focus on building the policies. For example, um, we could have a whole set of cooperative para virtualized schedulers with SCADEX um, if we have this sorted. Um, a lot of effort that goes into this redundant work 
could be saved if we just standardize the interface. It comes as part of the kernel, and people could just get started working on what actually they want to build on top of that. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or feedback, I think we have time now, as well as you can send me an email. One question. Um, I maintain the restartable sequence system call. Uh, in Linux 6.3, we've added a new field called concurrency ID. It is tracked and maintained by the scheduler, and it basically gives an information about the number of uh, threads that are currently running for a given process. So if we expose that information through uh, QMU, KVM, to the guest, perhaps we could create a, a concurrency ID-based scheduler of vCPUs within the guest and perhaps solve most of those problems that you guys are trying to work around. Just an idea. OK, so j just so that I understand it correctly, you already have a way to tell how many threads are running for a given task. Yes. OK, that, that's OK. It could solve, as you said, um, probably all of these problems. Thank you. I, I will check it out. Thank you. Uh, awesome work. Um, yeah, so as far as standardizing the interface, uh, one thing that I proposed to Joel, I think we've spoken about it as well, um, is if you could have KVM set up a channel between host and guest BPF programs, then you could have paravert take place within just BPF. So you have like no UAPI concerns, no ABI concerns. Um, for SCEDX, of course, you could use it for scheduling, but we could also set it up for other types of paravert as well if you're interested. Um, yeah, it's an idea that's been floated. I don't know if anybody's ever thought about it or if anybody's ever <laughs> interested in taking a stab, but that's something that I think could be powerful as well. OK, I mean, following on the patch set for the vCPU priority boosting, it seems very clear that, and for the right reasons, that none of this maybe should go through KVM. Well, so KVM would set up an opaque communication channel. But it, one of the problems with the, with the approach that, in my opinion, that, that uh, Joel and Vinith took was that, you had all these UAPI um, like structures that were added to KVM specifically, so you can never change it. It was one thing that you're doing in KVM, but if KVM's job was just to set up this opaque communication channel, then any type of paravert would automatically be enabled without any of those UAPI problems, right? It's just it's essentially just you ask it to set up like a shared memory mapping between the host BPF program and the guest BPF program, and then it's that's all it has to do. Okay, it's something to think about, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, yeah. I don't know if uh, the KVM folks will actually care for that either. Um, from, uh, from my discussion with the KVM guys, like they were like saying, if it could be done in user space, or if you could find a way around it, do it that way. So if the QMU could set everything up, because the QMU would actually know everything, it could actually set it up. They rather, the, K, the kernel folks sort of don't want to do it unless it absolutely necessarily has to, like the only way to be done. So just, yeah. I mean, I think at some point you're gonna need some kernel support, right? Because like the BPF program has to communicate like where it is in guest memory at, at the very least. But yeah, whether it's QEMU or KVM, it's not, I guess, super important, yeah. I think there was some proposal about a special kind of BPF map. Um, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm uh, suggesting, yeah. Okay. And um, um, I haven't followed up, up, uh, followed up on that, but in the LPC talk, um, like I, I think it was Vinit, like who is the author of the VCPU, one of the authors of the VCP Priority Boost uh, pet set, they tried it, and then there were some some issues. Um, so um, yeah, but maybe like to me uh, again uh, at SCADEX MC, I also talked about maybe the whole policy could be. Uh, provided as a set of BPF programs, and we can get rid of all the components that I have in the host kernel and guest kernel. Um, that and with that map type working properly, it could also be one way to realize the interface. Oh, sounds great.
Okay, seems like no more questions, so thank you.